G'day boys and girls, g'day Ross. Ross and Jono with you live. We are talking this week about, what is it Ross, Nehushtan? Nehushtan. Nehushtan. Last week we, we did uh, Azazel. We, we've done and Nephilim and Azazel. Tell you what, what, do, what do all of these have in common? We're going to find out. Um, when we discussed this topic, Ross, uh, or, or doing this topic, I thought, hey, that's pretty straightforward. I don't mind doing that. I, I think I right. have a grasp on that one. That's that's going to be easy, right? Um, yeah. And as I looked into it, I found myself asking more questions and uh, finding out that I wasn't so familiar with this topic. And I, so I have questions for you, Ross. Uh, okay. and I'm hoping I'm hoping you're going to be able to answer them in this week's show. Nahushtan, where shall we begin? I think we have to begin with the uh, with the story in. The book of Numbers is that fair? I think we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I'm like you. I got into this subject too. These the topics that we're getting into over the last few weeks are part of our new podcast series we're calling Beyond Belief. So uh, these can be, you know, they're they're kind of unbelievable in ways, but there are a lot of reasons that we're talking about the topics we're getting we're getting into. Again, Azazel, Nephilim, and now. Nakushtan. So so we're going to begin in Numbers 21, right? We're beginning in Numbers 21, and I think we have to kick off from verse 4. Is that fair? Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just say something about what comes right before even verse 4. Okay. There, there is this, uh, the narrative tells us that according oh. to Numbers 21, the children of Israel are moving, I guess you would say, west to east, and they're taken notice of by a Canaanite king, the king of Arad. And, mm. and we know where Arad is, by the way. So we, especially on the, on the Tanakh tour, we're going to drive mm -hmm. right by this area. Uh, but it is in the Negev, and the king yeah. of Arad is, is there, and it's a very oppressive uh, story if you look at it. They come out, there's this battle. And then we get into the story beginning in verse 4. So you're going to read it? What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? I was just going to quickly say, if we get time for uh, those who are on this year's Tanakh tour, uh, it, we have a very demanding itinerary. But, you know, you know, if we find that we have some spare time, we may go there because it's going. To, we're going to be right. We're going to be close to that. We'll, we'll see how we go. Uh, right. Arad, we know where that is. Um, significant place. Uh, yeah. And there, there's certainly a, a longer conversation that we can that could be had about those first three verses, but we don't have time for that. That's anyways. right. I just wanted to touch it. We're going to move on. That's right. We're going to move on. <laughs> All right. So this is the way this, and, and by the way, big white space in between uh, verse three and verse four, right? Um, right. This really is set apart, uh, this whole section. It's, it's by itself. Uh, and this is the way it begins. They, the children of Israel, set out from Mount Hor. Where is Mount Hor? We don't know. No one knows. It's a mystery. Well, um, we, well, we we think we do. We think we, we do, but that's another question. <laughs> Again, it's a much longer conversation. Uh, we went to a Mount Hor, um, uh, or or a, a candidate for Mount Hor. Yeah, uh, Dave um, and yourself and myself and Patty. Um, we, we, again, longer conversation. They right. set out from right. Mount Hor by way of the sea. Uh, sea of Reeds, Yamsuf, right? Uh, yep. To skirt around the land of Edom. But the people grew restive, is the word I have here, on the, and of course I'm reading from uh, this one. Uh, yep. they, they grew restive, Ross, on the journey, right. and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Yep. Kind of brazen. Why did you make us leave Egypt, they say, to die in the wilderness? There is no bread and there is no water. We have come to loathe this miserable food, right? Probably in reference to the manna, right? Oh, if yeah. that's all you're eating, it, it probably doesn't matter if it's ice cream, Ross. If all you're eating is ice cream every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you'd probably start to loathe that as well. Hey, but but, but, but um, hang on, but hang oh, on. Let, let okay. me just touch on this. You just mentioned something interesting. According to rabbinic tradition, Jono. Go on. You know, you, you got to bring this up. The manna mm -hmm. was whatever you love the most. So if you like, if you could close your eyes and take 
manna into your mouth, it would taste like whatever, like you made that goulash when you were here. Right? Oh, yeah. Hungarian goulash? If that happens to be your favorite, then that's what you would do. And Here's my, here's my favorite chocolate. 95% cocoa chocolate. It's just really good stuff. Um, there you go. This is probably what the manna would taste like for me. And I'm all telling right. you, if that's all I could eat, I'd probably get sick of it after a while. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So anyway, they're they're eating. They're tired of this light bread. Here what happens? Is. Tasted what? It, didn't it say that it tasted of coriander seed and so on and so yeah, forth? Yeah, honey. So despite and... despite the fact, so it's like chocolate with or ice, coriander seed flavored ice cream. All right. Uh, the the okay miserable food. They said the Lord sent. Now this is this is where it starts. The Lord sent seraph. I have in in this translation. And by the way. Right. Different translations vary. I mean, they really do. The Lord sent seraph serpents against the people. Now, here, of course, it's borrowing from the Hebrew because what what is seraph? Uh, this is exactly what it says in the Hebrew, and and this is one of the questions that we have to define. Uh, one of the terms we have to define. They bit the people, and many of the Israelites died, as yep. you do. Uh, yep. The people came to Moses and they said, "Oh, we sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you." intercede with the Lord to take away these serpents from us. And the Lord interceded for the people. Uh, Moses interceded for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a seraph. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, hey, make a seraph. Yep. Yep. Create an image and, uh, and mount it on a stand, on a standard. And if anyone who is bitten looks at it, at the, at the idol that, that you're going to make, he shall recover. And uh, so Moses, what did he do? He made a seraph. No, he didn't. He made a copper serpent. Now, we're talking about different terms here, Ross, and you're going to have to explain this in a minute. Oh, I know. I'm excited. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Moses made a copper serpent and mounted it on a standard. That much he did. Okay. And when anyone was bitten by a serpent, he would look at the copper serpent uh, and recover. All right. So it still had the same um, results. He didn't make a seraph, or did he? Or did he? That's not what the text says. It uses a different word. I'm. I, th there's a lot of questions about this. There are different terms that we need to define because the English is not so clear, and they and it varies the way that yep. it reads in various translations. Right. Yep. This is the first thing we have to uh, clear up, and in doing so, Ross, we're going to bounce to only a very select few verses that mentions right. these these terms. Uh, to try and help define it. And I'm not so sure that it makes it any clearer. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to do this for us. Where are we, hey, we going to go from here? So this is fun. So the first thing I want to do, now this is going to be very tough, Jonah, because we're both anxious to jump to some of these others. But what I want to do is throw out some of the terms that mm. we see. If we peer through the English, what do we see here? And And I bet you the audience is going to be they're going to have some things snapping off in their mind. So, so let's look at this. You read from uh, the JPS, mm. uh, which is not a very good translation in terms of a, a literal translation. It mm. happens to be one of our favorite Bibles, though, because of the notes. The study the notes. Jewish study That's Bible. That's right. Okay. So here we go. Mm. Uh, Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is mad because the people are making fun of the bread that he's given them. And he sends and, and. Because the people have spoken against Moses and against God. Mm. Now, it's this group of people, not everybody. This is a point we ought to make. There's The snakes aren't just randomly biting Israelites. The people that are bitten, Jonah, this is important, I think, and, and we don't know that it's important, but I feel like it might be important. The people who are getting struck by these serpents are... Mm the people who are rebelling against Moses and against God. How do we know that? Because that's what it says. Okay. Right? So, 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 so what, okay. So let me do, so what you're saying is that, uh, Wait, not I say, everyone, I say that's what it says. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep not going. everyone yeah. is rebelling, but those specifically who are rebelling, they're getting bitten. And, and it says some of them are, are just dropping dead, dropping dead. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So, okay. so here we go. Uh, and it says that Jehovah, verse 6, sent uh, in the English, my ASV says fiery serpents, but in the Hebrew it says 
Hanakashim, uh, Hanakashim, Haserafim. Right. Haserafim. Now, now, Did you hear so that? what we have then, yeah, Nachashim, so nach, a Nachash is, yeah. and I think everybody agrees with this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that everyone agrees, well, the Nachash is plain and simple, it's just a snake, right? That is the Hebrew word for snake, uh, Nachashim, snakes, plural. Okay, fine. Then mm-hmm. there, what what follows is the um, uh, is perhaps descriptive, right? It it alters that which we've already uh, um, made clear. Snakes, uh, has ser- uh, seraphim. Yeah. Um, okay. In what way does it does it okay. alter snakes? Is it descriptive? Is it the is it the color? Is it the appearance? Is it what? What is it about these? Okay, so so excellent question. Now, there's one place we want to go, but we don't want to go right away because most people look at this, including me, and you see the nakash is the word for serpent, as you pointed out. Mm-hmm. The word uh, seraphim is plural because the noun is plural. So it's nakashim, right. whatever you could say a nakash seraph, but it's a nakashim seraphim. So the, what, what does seraph mean? Most often that's understood to mean burning or fiery. So the idea, and this is what a lot of people put forward to define this or explain this, is that the venom of the serpents is burning. You know, like you get struck by a serpent, God forbid that this happens to us, uh, but, but it's a burning sensation. That's the way it's typically understood, that, that seraph is describing nakash. But we're going to look at that in just a moment. But there's another way. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that uh, that makes that a little bit more difficult to make. Ah, that clear. Okay, but we're not doing it yet. Okay, because so wait, wait, let me let me interrupt yeah. because I yeah. thought that that's the way I've always understood it, right? And I thought uh, this is going to be easy. You know, it's it's like this. And then there's there's verses in we got to go to Kings. We got to go to even we have to go to the New Testament, Ross. In yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, that's right. John chapter three, uh, just to be comprehensive on this topic but yeah. as i was looking at seraph i thought uh, and, and looking at, at verses like uh, we're going to get to in isaiah for example yeah it became i became less convinced that that was absolutely the definition we're going to get there all right that's right that's right so let me let's go through and and you kind of touched on i caught it because i know the inflection in your voice but uh, some people may not know exactly what you were Hinting in your reading. So here we go. Okay. Um, it's the people, the people go to Moses because some of them have been bitten and died. Hmm. And the people came to Moses, verse seven. We've sinned we, because we spoke against Moses and we spoke against you. Hmm. Uh, and it says, pray to Jehovah that he take, the English says, serpents away from us. Yeah. But, in, but that's not what it says in Hebrew. It's singular. It mm-hmm. says, get the serpent off of us. Mm-hmm. Now, I, now, what does that mean? I don't want to overinterpret, but the, the Hebrew Bible, the storyteller, knows how to say it in plural. It just did it, a verse and a half mm-hmm. above. Seraphim. But now, all of a sudden, they're asking to get the serpent off of them. Mm. And uh, some of the commentators go crazy with this, you know, because the serpent can represent in some people's understanding, the bad guy of the cosmology. I'm not going there. I'm just saying that's what some have done. Have if you heard I that? May, Did you? Yeah. If, yes. Now, if I may just interrupt uh, just for a minute, because Dave, and I have to bring this in, Dave just said, and I remember this story, and this relates directly to what you're saying right now. Dave just oh, said, Dave. Yeah. Dave said, uh, Ross saw a huge asp snake when he was uh, managing the um, Blossoming Rose facility in Arava, right? That's in Irovot. Interestingly, no. Irovot appears just after the... Um, that uh, is exactly that right. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll get there in just a minute. But what I want you to do, because you you just said they're asking that they that, that God get the snake off them. And yeah. you were told about these the snakes that, that so if you like, patrol the Arava at night. And yeah. what happens when they bite you? Just tell us about the one that you encountered, and then <laughs> yeah, um, Ofa uh, explain to you, you know, what happens when you get. Bitten, I got you know? it. 
I give, got give it. it to yeah. us. Okay. All right. So here, here's the deal. Thanks for bringing that up, Dave. Yeah, I was actually on the phone with you, Jono. Remember, I was there all by myself. <laughs> I heard, I heard a noise out in the camp. I am deathly afraid of snakes, by the way. And just like the picture that Seth depicted me on on the thumbnail, that's me, really. I'm like, ah. Uh. So I, I'm walking around to see what the mm -hmm. dogs are barking at. It's it's black uh, outside. It's dark other than the moonlight shining on the, the sand. Mm. Now, one thing we have in that desert place is we have black hose, which is water lines. Yeah. And But typically, water lines don't move at night. And so uh -huh. I'm walking with my light, and I happen to shine across the ground, and I see, as Dave says, this big snake slither off into the flower beds that I'm supposed to be maintaining while I'm there. By the way, I've never, I've, I hate to admit this, but I've never been around those flower beds since. But th <laughs> this snake was massive. So I go, I go talk to Ofer, who is a, a reptile specialist. He owns a crocodile, runs and manages a crocodile park right across the street. And I go hmm. see him. Now, Ofer is a good friend of mine. I, I'll have to show you a picture of this rough desert dweller. And he, he takes a big drag on his cigarette. He welcomes me. He's very calm. You know, you have to be calm when you deal with crocodiles. He takes a drag on his coffee and he said, what's going on, Ross? I said, man, look, last night I saw a big black snake. And in Louisiana, where I'm from, we have a black snake that eats other snakes takes a drag on his cigarette and i said it's a good snake he said yeah that's louisiana he said the black snakes here are not good snakes he said what you do if you get bite if you get bite from snake first remember snake doesn't inject poison as soon as it bites it must chew so you take the snake off of you and you break his neck like snap <laughs> And then you toss him he's away. Telling you this is if he's had a lot of practice, right? He's, this is exactly you pull it off. And oh just yeah, you snap. And does you it all draw. the time as he's yeah. And then he says, and then you you take one more. You know, he takes another drag. He said, and then you go call the people to come with the med medical uh, yeah. and just lay down. And lie down. That, way they can, down. that way they can find you. Yeah. Anyway, he says, so no, not too many people die from this, but it's very, 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 very painful. So you can imagine that after that night, I was very aware of my situation, like mm. as I walked <laughs> through the camp. <laughs> no doubt. But this area, but but look, if you look, Jono, let's mm. touch this while we're there. If you look at verse 10, mm. right after the story of the serpents, it says in verse 10, the children of Israel journeyed and encamped at Ovot. So the mm. very next place is Ovot which means that the snake biting incident happens very close to where very I see by. the serpent. Mm -hmm. uh, because on a map, people can look at a Bible map and they will see uh, that Ovot is located south uh, west of the Dead Sea near biblical Tamar. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's, here's the other thing. So we're going to come back to the local environment because I have another story we're going to share. But it's interesting. So get the serpent off of us in verse uh, in verse uh, seven, and then in verse eight, Jehovah says to Moses, in in the Hebrew it says uh, in verse eight, make uh, make for yourself a seraph, mm. a seraph. Now we we just define seraph as the word that means to burn. Nakash mm. means a serpent, but you're supposed to make a seraph, and you put the seraph on the nest, on the banner, on the pole. Mm. It's you you think it if seraph means snake, then you're gonna put a snake on a stake, right? And and That's you're it. gonna all right. So it says, make a seraph and put it or him upon a nest. Uh, and it will be all who are bitten and look upon him and they'll live. So you go, okay, okay. So get the Nakash off of us. Nakashim Haserafim, the fiery or burning serpents is what mm -hmm. we think. 
are biting the people, and so get the, the nakash off of us. But then God tells Moses, make a seraph, which mm, I thought meant burning. A, make a fiery, then, make a burning one, make, make a fiery uh, one. Make a fiery, make a burning, mm. whatever. And then it says, put it, okay, so now what does Moses make? Well, you he's got to he make a, a seraph. seraph. No, he doesn't. Jono, he doesn't. Let me tell you what he makes. Mm. In verse 9, it says, Vaya'as Moshe Nachash. Nachoshet. And Moses made a Nachash Nachoshet. Now, these words are very similar in Hebrew. If Nachash means serpent, Nachoshet means brass or bronze, mm. more Papa. likely in the Bronze mm. Age, it's bronze. Yeah, probably bronze. You're going to make a bronze serpent. Mm. He, he's told to make a seraph, but he makes a bronze serpent. He puts the bronze serpent on the pole. And sure enough, Jono. When when this thing is held up, the people that that are bitten are healed. I mean, I, I so, mean, does that make sense? Yeah, go it, ahead. It, it, I, I I had to reason with this as I do with everything, and I and I thought, well, what does this mean? Does it mean a what? What could it possibly mean? What would make the most sense in light of God saying, "Make a seraph"? Um, I had to conclude that perhaps uh, a fair possibility would be that it is. It is a snake, but it's a specific snake, and it's, it's a, a specific breed of snake which was afflicting the people, and that is the seraph. So it's like uh, uh, at the opening of this program, Dave, g'day, David Con Con Connolly. Uh, he said, hey, do you have an eastern brown as a pet, right? So the eastern brown, yeah. Dave, David would know, um, is amongst the most venomous snakes in the world, and we have those here, like they're everywhere, and particularly when I used to live in the country, you know, when I had goats, right? Yeah. Um, you'd see them all the time, like the, the, the most venomous and they were a copper bronze color. Yeah. Uh, that's why they're called these Eastern Brown. They're just this, uh, or a copperhead. They're just really, yeah. um, uh, that, that coppery brown yeah. color. And they are just thoroughly the most venomous snake and you will die within seconds if you get bitten. Yeah. Um, maybe it's yeah. like that. It's a snake, but it's a. Uh, an Eastern Brown. It's, it's okay. A it's a, now let, let me, yeah, let's, let's think about this because if, you know, a lot of times uh, words, I love etymology, how we get certain words, even in English mm. or, uh, you know, it, if you look at the word serpent mm. and, and you spell with, uh, you spell with the consonants, you have an S, an R, a P, N, T, serpent, mm. Uh, it's very similar to seraph, which is an S sound, an R sound, a, a P or an F, mm -hmm. a labial sound, as we call it in okay. the Hebrew. It's a seraph. So it could yeah. be that you're right, that a nakash is sort of like saying, hey, when you're at Biblical Tamar Park, watch out for the snakes. Mm. And and if somebody, an expert like Ofer, who lives across the street, said, uh, hey, watch out for the serpents, you know, the yeah, serpents. Yeah. Or he you might know, say there, particularly, not just the snakes, but particularly the black snake, which is called a such and such. The African okay. cobra is what it's called, by the so way. One is what generic, so maybe maybe Nakash is generic and, and uh, Seraph is specific to a particular breed, maybe. Yeah. Now, now when one thing that is interesting, if you can go, Jono, look at, um, look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse All right. 15. Well, I am curious about this. Oh yeah, no, I did. I did say okay. I did you have this verse in your notes too? See, we never talk about this before we go live, but no. uh, in fact, um, well, now I have the uh, the the Koran open here, so I'm going to read. From right, the, uh, this happens to be in front of me now. Uh, okay, brother out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage, who led the through the great and ter terrible wilderness in which were ven venomous serpents and scorpions and drought and there was no water uh yeah. who brought you through the water and so on and so forth okay so venomous uh serpents what is that okay so in in the hebrew it does say the great and awesome or the big and awesome awe-inspiring desert nachash saraf nachash uh, saraf the akrav so it's serpent that. serpent um a, a snake serpent and and, and scorpion, uh, scorpion. Yeah. remember now notice remember when we're at biblical tomorrow and again the biblical uh tanakh tour gets to see these areas 
Uh, hmm. But in this area where we're going, you're going to be in the place. Some people are saying, well, I don't want to go now. No, you don't. We're going to protect you. Uh, I am a brave snake chasing guy. I mean, all I need is my hat and I'm, I'm back in the game. <laughs> you're on. Uh, yeah. I'll show you how to get away from them, actually. But but notice you have the Akrav beam. The Akrav mm. is a scorpion. Remember the ascent of the scorpions? Mm. Uh, scorpions ascent. So so this desert is that place. Now let me mm. let me tell you another story. This is an adventure that Dave Tyler. Uh, it was me, Dave Tyler, and Dave Cole. Yeah. We there was a, a time the Tylers were there making a video. And, and they had hired a guy to do the video who happens to be, he has a website that he specializes in. He'll visit biblical sites and do a full-blown report and put it on the web. I'll post that mm. website later. So he he comes. Something happens. His drone gets shot down by the Israeli uh, military. Oh, I remember but this, yeah. Dave says, come anyway. We're going to, the guy shows up and he happens to know places. He comes into the dining hall. I have maps everywhere. This is goes, This is uh, Yoram. This is guy's Yoram. name is Yoram. All right, hmm. uh, but you're yeah, you're talking about another guy that did film hmm. for uh, Tyler. But anyway, hmm. Yoram is he walks in and he says, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm studying where the tribes were in the book of Bamibar. At the time, the the Torah portion that week was this time." So he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, right here. Oh, vote. Oh, vote. It's in uh, Bami Bar. It's in the book of Numbers. I said, yeah. yeah. I said, I do feel like this is the biblical oh, vote, even though it could be a modern name. We don't know for absolute positive. He goes, no, no, no. No, it's oh, vote. I said, well, how do you know? He says, uh, uh, because other places. And in the King James or in the English, any English Bible, there is a place mentioned called Punan. Mm. It's, it's mentioned in the itinerary. They're very close. They go from, you know, one place to the next. And, and it's pretty much right in the, the you go from Ovot. I think Punan is mentioned within just a few verses. Mm. So he goes, yeah, in, in Hebrew, it's Fenon. Fenon. It's right across the road. And he said that place is where the ancient copper mines were. All right, get this. Mm. So I'm going to pull up a picture, Jono, because I have in my hand. Uh, anyway, so Dave Tyler and Dave Cole and I said, can you take us? And he said, yeah, it's right there. So we jumped on, uh, we jumped in a vehicle and drove four minutes to this ancient uh Just hilltop. four minutes away. Yeah, it's, okay. it's right across. It's at the yellow gas station, basically. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Look at this. Let me pull up a picture of this, a little bit closer picture for you. Hmm. This is um, this is a piece of slag in my hand, hmm. and and what you'll see is uh, that this it's got some green in it. If you can see that green in the black rock, it's a piece of uh, smelted uh, copper. That's right. That's right. Okay. So what they would do in in this place is they would take these pieces of copper mm. and and burn a fire so hot that ultimately the the copper would melt out of mm. this and you would have this is what's left. So these mm. pieces of this are still there. And uh, this is just a sample that I got just for this purpose. Yeah, that's cool. uh, but anyway. Yeah, so so we know that this was the ancient place. We know that the Edomites in particular ruled this place in the Iron Age. If mm. you back up to the Bronze Age, which is earlier for those who don't know, uh, this region was, was known worldwide. Egyptians were coming to this area to get their copper melted. Now, why right. do I bring all this up? Because imagine the story of Moses being told to make a seraph and he wants to make a nakash nakoshit out of, you got to have copper. Mm. So he says, hey, this is me. This isn't exactly in the Bible. This is the way I imagine it happened. He right. goes, uh, Yehoshua, come here, come. And uh, he says, look, go over across, just walk right over there by the gas station and get, it to, get some copper melted for us because God told me I have to make this the serpent. 
This, this so image. that's what happened. It's right mm. there. It's right there. Now, here's what we know from the Bronze Age. Um, we, we have several places where bronze was discovered. Uh, bronze snakes in particular were discovered. And many of these places we're going to. So, you know, Gezer, which is on our Israel mm -hmm. itinerary, mm -hmm. there was a, a, uh, an ancient a snake cultic object found at Gezer. There was some found at Megiddo. We're going to Megiddo. Yeah. There was some found at, at uh, several other places. And we're not going to Timna, which is way south. But mm. at Timna, in the museum, when that. you go in, there's. did you remember, we did we go there together? There's a bronze serpent that they found that dates to the Bronze Age. I mean, it's just, this is incredible that this snake cult mm. or some kind of weird... Well, Nike. Well, here's the thing. Now, now we have not yet. People might be thinking, "What has this got to do with Nehoshe? What What is that? Because we haven't mentioned that yet, or where that comes from." Um, and and we're going to get there, and uh, it'll start to make sense. But yes, the the idea of um, uh, of a of a a copper snake or a bronze snake image uh, or depictions of um, uh, a snake on on a rod or a snake as a rod. Um, it certainly seems like the the snake represents some sort of divine power in the minds of the ancients, and that's something that goes back, you know, three four thousand years uh, sure. BCE, uh, way before Moses. You know, and as you said, the the, the Egyptians would come and and um, mine their copper and smelt their copper there, and probably even um, uh, uh, make uh, images of of certain. I, I bet they, I bet they had little molds there, and you could say, uh, yeah. "Excuse me, I need give me two, and... two snakes and a little cow. Could you get a cow? How about one with big horns? Could I get a maybe a hemorrhoid? Could I get a golden hemorrhoid? Made? That's <laughs> another this, story. That's another story. But this is, but you know, I mean, uh, just going online and having a bit of a fish around on this particular topic, and you see an enormous plethora of images, uh, particular, uh, particularly Egyptian images. Of gold and bronze um, uh, serpents, winged serpents, in fact, yeah. which are not unusual either. Now, before we get to Nachosh, do we want to go there, or do we want to talk about the Caduceus, or what do you want to do here? Get uh, fire it off. What what what's the word you just used? What is a Caduceus? I don't even a know caduceus. what that is. Okay. Now, now, the reason why I bring up the Caduceus Wait, is it yep. like Medusa? It's well, you know what? It's a it's a little bit like that in that it involves a snake. I mean, Medusa had uh, hair of snakes, and uh, um, uh, when you beheld her uh, hideous form, um, so many jokes just came to mind, and I can't yeah, say any of them. It turns you to um, turns you to stone. You would, you would turn to stone. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, but in this case, a, a caduceus. I think it's pronounced that way. Is that familiar familiar to you? Never heard of a, it. That, um, that's okay. All right. So it's a, it, now everyone is familiar with, uh, everyone actually is familiar with the caduceus. And the reason why, particularly in the States, is because the medical emblem is a caduceus. Ah. What ah. that is, is a, a, a pole with a couple yeah. of snakes intertwined, and in this case with the wings, right? Okay. And there, once again, there are examples of this in various forms going back to um, Mesopotamia, going back to uh, ancient Greece and particularly in mythology, uh, Roman times as well would use this image and, and uh, more often than not, than not use the wings. You know, sometimes it appears with wings, sometimes not. And when we uh, look at that, many people who are familiar with the Bible, Ross, go, oh, oh, that comes from, that comes from Numbers. That comes from Numbers chapter 21 when Moses made a, a, a snake on the pole. And this is this is why we use it as the as the um, uh, the emblem of the medical association because when you look at it you're healed right and yeah. that's a very fair conclusion to come to but actually it's wrong this okay. this particular image the Caduceus uh, comes directly from Greek mythology and as so I wait, wait 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 let me let me get this straight Jonas so yeah. you're telling me that at some stages in history. Hmm. Ancient peoples were making a some kind of god, or was it an idol that they prayed to, or was it just an object of healing? You can say that it's an idol. It's a representation of divine power. 
okay. uh, that uh, in this case Hermes, I think uh, the Greek god Hermes um, has a uh, well. I'll tell you what. Let me read you the story while while we're talking about the Caduceus because this okay. is really cool. All right. Okay, so um, one of the origin stories in Greek mythology, uh, in as far as this is concerned, is in a story. Let me see if I can find this. And I'm just, uh, and you can read more on this in uh, the Wikipedia. And I'm just going to read one, a few sentences here. One okay. Greek myth origin on the Caduceus is part of the story of uh, what's this guy's name, Tiresias, uh, okay. who found two snakes copulating and killed the female with his staff. Right? Uh, Tiresias was immediately turned into a woman. Okay. Uh, and so remained until he was able to repeat the act with the male snake seven years later. This staff later came into the possession of the god Hermes, right? Greek god Hermes, uh, along with its transformative powers. Uh, emphasis on the syllable trans. And so this is a trans this is a trans stick that changes the gender of the person who kills the snake. Is that right? There you go. Right. Uh now. Uh, it Weird. has um, uh, magical powers, having gone through this twice, and uh, Hermes uh, comes to possess it. And um, so the Caduceus is um, uh, the staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology, consequently by um, uh, oh, the same staff is, is borne by other heralds like uh, Iris, the messenger of Hera. Uh, the short staff is entwined by two serpents, sometimes surmounted by wings in Roman iconography, it was uh, depicted being carried by the left hand of Mercury's in left okay. hand. Okay, all right. Of, of, okay, of, so... of, of Mercury, sorry, uh, okay. and the messenger of the gods. Okay, so so it's 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 uh, all over know, the ancient world. It's all over all the, over ancient, the ancient, world. ancient world. And and you mentioned something, Jono. I want to pick up on if I think I heard you. You're you're saying that sometimes these uh, these uh, caduceus, if that's the plural, hmm. is uh, you're. There is a uh, uh, an element of wings. There's a flying. Is that what you mentioned? There is something there's, about there's, flying. Yeah, yeah. There's a, an element of wings. Now, now I know where you're about to go, and that's exactly where I went because, uh, and it made me very curious, and I'm very interested in what your thoughts are because I know you're in this book we're about to go to at the moment on your Shabbat morning classes. Um, it is. Uh, it, it, let me just say again, the caduceus is a pole with a snake on it, often two snakes intertwined, uh, decorating the pole. It, it, it is a, a staff of power, of divine power, if you like, and um, it, it represents. And it is often depicted, in addition, with wings. Now, the pole has wings, not the snake. The pole has wings at the top. Um and uh, and that's often more often than not, I think, a, a Roman addition to the to that representation. Where are you going to take us? Well, I, I tell you, you, I can't help but think of a vision that uh, the prophet Isaiah has in chapter six, verse one. And and the way I understand this, oh. I believe that this is the call of Isaiah. And uh -huh. in Isaiah's vision, he sees the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the temple and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And he says that he, he beholds and there are uh, what he calls even in English, by the way, I remember growing up as a kid and reading the story in my King James. And if I'm not mistaken, it even used seraphim. It we does. Just I'm, use looking that at, word. I'm looking at the King James right now and it says, starting in verse one, let me do this. Okay. So in yeah, the year that yeah. Zaya died, I, I, this is uh, Isaiah speaking in the first person way to understand. I yeah. saw uh, the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, that's it, the Lord. Is that Jehovah or is that Adonai? I think it's Adonai, right? I think it's Adonai, yeah. Yeah. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, as you just said. And it goes on to say, above it, uh, above the temple, above it stood the seraphims. Now, it says it has seraphims. Uh, right. sir, the M being the plural of, of Hebrew and S being the plural of English. It's kind of like the seraphim. Uh, yeah. Each one had six wings. Ah. Uh, with twain. Oh, we don't get to use that word very often. With twain, yeah. he covered uh, his face. 
And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And that was the purpose of the six wings. Uh, one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Jehovah um, uh, of hosts. Unless, uh, unless, unless you're reading the Isaiah scroll at Qumran and it just in says, In which case holy, it only holy. says, Holy, holy. That's right. But, but be that as it may. Yep. Mm. The, okay. Uh, the whole earth is full of his glory and so on and so forth. And uh, and it goes on and, and we even read from Isaiah, he says that one of them in verse six, uh, one of the seraphims flew unto me and with a live coal and uh, put it on my lips. That was great. Okay, so okay. let me let me tell you what I think this indicates to us. In in the story in Isaiah six, the, the word seraph, again, let's say it means to burn or fire. It, mm. it indicates to us that these beings, we tend to, a lot of times people talk about the types of angels. There mm. are uh, cherubim or keruvim, as we say in Hebrew. Mm. There mm. are seraphim, as we mm. say. But in this case, these beings, whatever they are, they're not called angels or malachim, messengers. But what they do is they attend the altar. And, and in this particular case, you have one that grabs with a, a set of tongs a hot coal. So that would make sense. You're like, now, well, what is this being? Well, it's a some let me kind ask of you this. Let yeah. me ask you this. If it's all a bit weird, I gotta admit, all right. So you yeah. allow me just to be weirded out by this. If right. the seraphim are are fiery angels, right? With with yeah. uh, six wings, um, two covering mm. their eyes, two covering <clears> their feet, and, and with two they're flying, right? And then uh, uh, Isaiah says, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips, da da da, da. He's like, I got a remedy for that. Let me go and get one of these hot coals, and I'm made of fire, and yeah. I'm just going to go and pick <clears> it up because well, I'm made of fire. It's not like I'm going to get burned. But no, yeah. no, no, don't burn my little fiery fingers. I need the tongs, right? I need yeah. my fire hand to get the tongs to take the – to take it mm. and then go and touch it. That's a little bit odd. I'm not too sure. Okay, what to all right, but hang on, hang on. I, I would, okay. I would just, just say this, Jono. I think I, my my understanding could be that maybe they don't have little fiery fingers. This is just a think something to think about. Okay, they might look like. Uh, imagine a being uh, that happens to have. Uh, three sets of wings. Two they cover their face. Two they cover mm -hmm. their feet. By mm -hmm. the way. Feet is generally understood to be a euphemism. Uh, you know what that means. So there's two oh, okay, that sure. cover their, yeah, so it covers Maybe. their uh, yep. privates, and mm -hmm. with two they fly. But what these what these things do is, I don't know that they're fiery beings, but they attend the altar. Uh, they, sure. they are associated with fire, but they may not be like uh, flamey, fiery looking. I, I'm just saying, you know. Maybe. Well, yeah. the other alternative for us is maybe they represent a type of snake, a seraph. Maybe they, yeah. maybe a snuff, a seraph is a type of snake, as we speculated earlier, and they have a, it's a six-winged seraph. But then with what? Does it grab the tongs and take the, anyway, all right. So okay, wait, let me ask you this. I'm going to go, go somewhere ahead. a little bit, a little bit strange. We're going to come back to this idea of what the seraphim might look like or whatever, but hmm. there's one other passage in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 14 uh, and verse 20, Jono, and and uh, see what you think about this. Um, let me Where see. Uh, I'm, I think it's Isaiah 14, 20. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've got that. Okay. Now, we're not going to do the whole thing. That's a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. um, but, no, look but it, at, it look at verse 29. Yeah, so here it is. So it says, um, and again, this is the King James. <clears throat> Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, <laughs> uh, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root. Now, again, many different translations, Ross. And if you've got a different translation, I'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, look, that's a pretty good translation, uh, other yeah. than cockatrice. Uh, what, what is that? From, well, what it's nakash. Mean? It's nakash. What's cockatrice? It says, yeah, it says because he, uh, because from Shoresh, the root mm -hmm. of a nakash will go forth 
Uh, and then, then there's a, another word for adder, which huh. is sefa. And uh, so basically, it's, it's describing this serpent type. For out of the serpent's roots, out of nakash, shall come forth an adder, A-D-D-E-R, uh-huh. and his fruit, something that comes from it, is a uh, a seraph, which ofeth. It's so it says seraph ofeth. It's sort of a an it kind of sounds. It's an so, alliterative thing. So, so it's listen, a burning uh, in in the Koran. All right, it says, "For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a viper, and his fruit shall be a venomous flying serpent." Now here's here's what I'm saying, Jono. This oh. is weird stuff. I, you it's know, weird stuff. I, all I've got I got this weird vision going on here, mm. and and what I have to wonder is, what if what if the you got a flying a flying seraph, whatever that is, Moses, he's told, look, the not get the nakash off the people. Nakashim Haseraphim are biting the bad people. They look at something that's put on a pole. He's told to put a serpent, but instead he makes a seraph. This is crazy, but I'm Mm. wondering, do you think it was a snake he put on there? What if, I know this is crazy. Go ahead. What if the thing that he puts on the pole yeah. Is not a slippery, slimy, snaky figure, but a form, a being which may be a body that has pairs of wings. Maybe I'm. I don't. More of an idol. Uh, mm-hmm. The figure of a man. Now, now, if that. Now, I'm willing to to entertain that. But then, why then? Why would um, uh, the narrative begin with? Uh, they're being attacked by uh, seraph snakes. Uh, why? Why is that? You, well, are you suggesting then that they're being attacked by little snake men? I, I, I mean, well, I'm, I'm I, not... I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think know the either. whole story is weird. It sounds hmm. like in in part of the story, it sounds like it's really snakes, just like the snake I saw at Biblical Tamar. You you have a, a snake, and the people are getting bit. What they say is they they're like get the snake off of us. Mm. Uh, God says go make a uh, you know a seraph and put that on a pole and they'll mm. look at this and it'll heal them from the burning. Mm. And but he doesn't make what God tells him to make and put it on a pole. Instead, he makes a a bronze nakash. Now is is the nakash a uh, I guess my question, I know it's crazy, but I'm just wondering, could there be some mixing of stories here? Well, you gotta... well, now I'm going to go, if if you will allow me, I'm now going to go to the New Testament, which is something I rarely do, but it has okay. to be done in this case. Um, and I've just grabbed Bible number three off the shelf, and I'm going to go to uh, everybody. If you ha- If you said to any Christian, what is the most famous New Testament verse? That everybody knows, or almost everybody knows. If you had to guess one, if you had to represent the New Testament with one verse, what would it be, Ross? It's John, probably gonna... John chapter three, verse sixteen, John O'Vandor. And what does that say, Ross? Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There it is. And is now, right? just just be- that's exactly what I was going to say. And just before that. Uh, it says this from verse, um, let's say verse fourteen, and as and this is this is Jesus uh, or the writer of John is uh, having us believe that Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus, and this is the converse, this is the way the conversation went, right? All right. Uh, and as Moses, uh, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, as Moses, uh, let's see, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And yep. then goes on to verse 16. Um, so what we're to understand from that is that uh, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, hey, uh, in the same way that I'm going to be uh, executed, uh, look to me and live, in the same way that the Israelites looked to the image of the the serpent. Now, what is the word here that's used, by the way? I mean, obviously, we're dealing with the Greek. 
Um, but the word serpent, did, did you, do you know I, much I about didn't, this? I didn't even look. I don't know. I don't even look. But, but it's an interesting thing because if you follow the analogy, if they're being bitten by snakes and the seraph is a, is a serpent and the magic yeah. seems to work, so yeah. obviously Moses has done something right, then the analogy follows that there are perhaps evil men that are uh, surrounding the people that are that are metaphorically biting on them and causing them to die or poison or whatever. Uh, but therefore, the Son of Man is lifted up, and if you look to Him, um, then you'll be healed of this affliction. It's yeah. not exactly what Jesus was going for, but it's interesting in the fact that He's saying, "Look, you know, I'll be lifted up. Look and live, if you like." Right um, <clears throat> is, is the idea we're supposed to take. But but your point is. Maybe it the maybe a seraph is is more of a human sort of a image like uh, the cherubim are where to understand a sort of uh, it, it's anthropomorphic it's, uh, angels with wings and so on you know and I don't I don't have any uh, evidence for that other than it is later um, considered to be basically uh, an idol in a way. Okay. Well, hold on right there. So okay. before we go right. there, there's there's right. John chapter three verse fourteen. Now, if I now I'm in my trusty New King James Study Bible, right? Sure. If I go back to where we began, which is Numbers chapter twenty one, in this Bible, uh, it says uh, in the study notes on this particular uh, topic. <laughs> this is great. I love this. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, okay. So it says, by the um, way, by the way, Jonah, let me, you know what this sounds a little bit like? It sounds mm -hmm. a little bit like the idea of the hair of the dog that bit you, you know, it's like certain thing that brings you trouble is the same thing that's used to, to heal you. Yep. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, yep. go ahead. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is the, the study note on this particular narrative in numbers in my new King James Nelson study Bible. And tell me if this sounds right to you. Okay. God's discipline came upon the people in the form of fiery serpents. This is the point that you're making. Snakes with poisonous venom, for which uh, there was no antidote, caused raging fevers and agonizing deaths. Well, I think they're elaborating a little bit there, but um, yeah. sure. Uh, the pain of the venomous bites drove the people to repent. They begged Moses to intervene on, on their behalf. Moses instructed, uh, God instructed Moses to make an image, uh, which obviously goes directly against the uh, uh, the first yeah. commandment, but we'll come back to that perhaps, yeah. to make an image of one of the serpents and to set it on a pole. That's in bold in my, in my uh, notes. Yeah. Anyone who has been bitten and looked at the uh, image lived. The raising of such a contemptible uh, uh, symbol on a pole ordinarily, Ross, would have caused the people to shrink away in revulsion, is what the study notes are asserting. But uh, in this case, the Israelites had to look at the serpent's image in order to live. And then it says, Jesus pointed to this stunning image in his analogy, in his dialogue with, with uh, Nicodemus, as an analogy of his own execution. Uh, to the Jews, crucifixion was a sign of a curse. Therefore, just as the Israelites had to look on this repugnant, up, uh, 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 uplifted image of a serpent to be saved, uh, we today have to look at the uplifted image of Jesus on a cross in order to be saved from our sins. Well, let me ask you something, Ross. I'm ready. Did they find this image repugnant? Is this something I, that they ordinarily would have shied away from? Is that I, what happened? I tell you. I don't think when I read the biblical narratives that I see uh, Israel or Judah, if people want to distinguish between the two, any, any time in the history of this group saying, oh, there's an image. I can't participate in any bad worship because I'm, you know, that's not what we read. And it's in the an image of a snake and it's repugnant and I can't oh, bear to look at it. It's repulsive. No, they run, even, they run to this kind of stuff. Uh, How do we know that? Well, we see it over and over and over in the biblical well, text. We see it specifically in one case in, in, in this regard. Whereabouts is that one? I don't know where you're going. I, I'm not. We're I'm not going to. Yes, you do. We're going no, to Kings. 
We're going to see. Oh, no, 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 no. But before you do, but before you do, don't go to that yet. Hold up. One second. Okay. I'm holding on. I'm going to bring one other case in where this story is talked about. We have the Pentateuch. We have the Christian New Testament. Uh, What we also have is in the Apocrypha, in the wisdom of Solomon. Now, this this is dated by most scholars uh, to roughly... It's it's a long window. It's 250 BCE to 50 of the Common Era. Most people date this text to around 50, uh, 30 BCE, about the time when Herod uh, rises. Okay, so here we are in the Wisdom of Solomon, Jono, chapter 16. Mm-hmm. And it says in verse 5, When the terrible rage of wild animals came upon your people, They were being destroyed by the bites of writhing serpents. Your wrath did not continue to the end. But they were troubled for a little while as a warning and received a symbol of deliverance to remind them of your law's command, Jonah. For the one who turned toward it was saved, not by the thing that was beheld, but by you, the Savior of all. And by this also, you convinced our enemies that it is you who deliver from every evil. For they were killed by the bites of locusts and flies, and no healing was found for them because they deserved to be punished by such things. But your children were not conquered even by the fangs of venomous serpents, Jono, because Uh your mercy came to help and heal them to remind them of your oracles they were bitten. And then they were quickly delivered so that they would not fall into deep forgetfulness and become unresponsive to your kindness. Neither herb nor poultice cured them, but it was your word, O Lord, that heals all people. For you have power over life and death and lead mortals down to the gates of Hades and back again. Almost done. A person in wickedness kills another, but cannot bring back the departed spirit or set free the imprisoned soul. So this yep. basically, uh, one point that I was going to bring out of this is mm. in that intertestamental period, as some people call it, roughly 30 BCE, there was a thought that went around that was cautioning, and I find this interesting, uh, there, there is a caution there, don't, don't look at the thing, Jono, this weird uh, whatever serpent or seraph or a burning whatever bronze whatever on a stick that's not what's saving you that is the means whereby jehovah told moses make this and if they look at that they'll be healed whatever which is also weird that's no, well, you're not supposed to make anything you're not supposed to do it and let me emphasize the weirdness of this because even now where did you just read from again what was that source uh, that is from Wisdom of Solomon, uh, uh, right. chapter 16, verse 5. Let me just read one. from, I just want to read a study note uh, from Brettler here in the, in the um, Jewish study Bible. Uh, and this is the study note on verse 9, Copper Serpent, right, of, of uh, Numbers chapter 21. Um, yeah. Rabbinic interpreters were disturbed by the magical nature of this cure. And suggested yeah. that it was the uh, the glance of the afflicted to their father in heaven rather than the snake which affected the cure. In other words, they look up because it's on a pole. They look up to the to the snake on a pole. And they're not really looking at the snake on the pole. They're looking up beyond through there to the to uh, to God and and looking to God is what what did it. But when you read the text, that's clearly not what's going on. But this is what um, Rashi highlights in his commentary from uh, Rush Hash 29A. So yeah. it is it is curious, but it, it, it highlights the fact that even the rabbis are going, well, this is weird. Here's an yeah. idol, you know. It's, yeah, it's, and, it's very and to your point, I, I was aware of the reading in Rashi, and uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not one who, who reads a lot of Rashi, to be honest, mm. but I do have Rashi, and I did pull mm. Rashi down. And, and what typically happens in a lot of these commentators even the brilliant ones that are well respected within Judaism and so forth, is is they no one really wants to say, you know, these people are idolaters. 
and, and this is a weird case of making a form of something which is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or on the water. It's not kosher, but most people will bless it and say, yeah, but God said to make it. Well, why? Okay. Mm. But, but what we also find is what you just said. There is a, an excusing where people go, these holy Israelites, the same ones that were bitten for being rebellious, look past the idolatrous piece to the Father in heaven because they're so righteous and they look to him for healing. Mm. That's not what they did. It's the wisdom of Solomon says what they should have done. Mm. But instead, what did they do, Jonah? What happens to this thing that is ascribed to the hand of Moses? And and this and this is where we're going and and just coming back to the question of did uh, as my New King James study notes would suggest ordinarily the Israelites would have been repulsed at, at having to look at such an image and so on and so yeah, forth right. would have would have uh, found it repugnant and would have shied away from such a thing. Before we go there, I'm just going to read and uh, remind people that when we go on the Tanakh tour, and if you're thinking about coming on the Egypt Jordan tour, too late, can't do it. You're going to have to wait till next year. We are going to do it next year. Those details will be coming soon. There's Uh, only to be, as far as Egypt, Jordan, there's only to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, I'm sorry. But Israel, can they still get in? Oh, you better put your deposit down today. (laughs) Because really, we're... Could they, though? Do you think that it's still... It's it is still possible. It is still open, but by okay. a skerrick. I mean, you've really got to okay. put your deposit down today. If you've been going, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Stop procrastinating. Get your deposit down today because, um, or in the next couple of days. But uh, seriously, uh, all right. Um, but that's tanaktours.com. Okay, so yeah. uh, when we go to Nebo, right, um, as we're uh, concluding our tour in uh, Jordan. Uh, Mount yeah. Nebo, which is, of course, the traditional mountain from which Moses views the Holy Land uh, and, and is not uh, doesn't continue on, but Joshua takes them on and so on and so forth. They cross over the Jordan. Uh, we're going to be going there, but at, atop Mount Nebo is a, um, a sculpture. Look at, look at your screen. Uh, and, okay, let me go there. And there it is. Okay, now there's that sculpture. Now that sculpture is uh, what's referred to as a serpentine cross sculpture atop Mount Nebo created by Italian artist uh, Gian Paolo Fantoni, uh, I'm going to say. Uh, it is, now, this is this description, again, on Wiki, it is uh, symbolic of the miracle of the bronze serpent invoked by Moses in the wilderness and the cross upon which Jesus was crucified. Now, if I'm looking at this and I didn't know that, I would say to you, here is another example of a pole with a snake and wings. Yeah. To me, that looks very much like wings. But, okay, yeah. but, okay, across, all right, sure. Um, but it, it does, I mean, I would, I would look at that and I'd say, yeah, caduceus, it's another caduceus, it's another form of. Uh, and so I can understand why people get confused by the two. And I would say that uh, this imagery comes from the same sort of origin, ancient origins. In any yeah. case... We go to with this all this whole package. I'm ready. Nehushtan. Where do we get this from? We are now in Second Kings chapter, what is it, 17? 18. 18. And it is verse uh four. Four. Okay. He, now this is uh, Hezekiah. Yep. Uh, he removed, and this is again from the King James, he removed the high places and he break the images. And he cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Yeah. All right. So many questions here. One of them is, who is he? Is that Moses or is that Hezekiah? Who called it Nehushtan, Ross? I want to know. Hezekiah. Um, and uh, what did I say? What's that? I'm sorry. You 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 asked me uh who who is calling it Nehushtan? It? Yeah. Right. As a Kair or or Moses, that's one question. Uh and the other question is um what does it mean for the children of Israel to burn incense to this uh to this uh, image this idol? All right, go ahead. Yeah, the the first thing that is very clear is that uh this is a capture in 2 Kings 18 sort of a summary of how wonderful Hezekiah's reform was and how far-reaching it was. 
Uh, by the way, if you look at Chronicles, the chronic the account in Chronicles, it mentions none of these things specifically. But Kings, I find to be on the street. It, it's like a really solid report of what's happening in the street. And and notice you cut down the Asherah, and and mm. then it's break in pieces. This uh, in Hebrew, it's nechash hanachoshet. That's the same phrase that's used in Numbers chapter 21. So the implication is that the very thing that Moses made had been preserved all this time and people were uh, using it in some form of worship. It says, as you pointed out, has to do with the burning of incense, uh, which is, is it's, it's an offense to God. I mean, it's like, this hmm. is an unholy thing. They're they're uh, they're associating it with worship. It seems now. Uh, I didn't look at the the uh, comments that Brett may have had. Is did he have something in the JPS? Well, is it? Yeah, I'm just going to that now. So uh, oh oh on um, Second Kings. Well, let's find out. I didn't I didn't let's do that now. So it's Second, Second Kings, Kings eighteen four. Mm hmm. Now, people are going, why didn't you guys read this before? And I'm telling you, there is so much on this topic. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so he says, well, all, of my, all of my Bibles are about to um, avalanche upon me. Okay. <laughs> uh, elimination of the uh, open shrines, concentrated worship in Jerusalem. Uh, the author describes Nehushtan, uh, a form of the word for serpent, he says, uh, as an ancient relic associated with the miraculous healings in the wilderness held sacred by the Israelites. Nothing that the Hebrew uh, actually says, uh, noting that the Hebrew actually says he called it uh, and not it was called. Uh, yeah. Rashi suggests that Hezekiah, uh, the active subject of the sentence, labeled it bronze serpent thing, Nehushtan. That's, I like that. I like that. You like that? Okay. In I, Hebrew, yeah. uh, as a pejorative, Okay, what what you, so you you think that he is is Hezekiah? Absolutely, yeah. It, it flows most naturally. It's like the way I envision this when I read it, and, you, and especially when you look at the Hebrew, it seems that uh, Hezekiah is on the the war path against these idols, and and it's like he says, "Bring me that brass thingy, that brass thingy that Moses, right. made, the the nechash nechosh, the brass thing." Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. It it doesn't. He doesn't say. Um, it, he calls it nechushtan, but again, that that doesn't mean. I don't think it means snaky thing. I think it means that brass thingy, you know, or the bronze thingy, the shiny. Bring me that shiny idol that they're worshiping. Mm -hmm. We're going to destroy that. And he breaks it in pieces. Now it's interesting by the way, and we do not have time to get into this, but I will touch on it. In Isaiah, uh, it, throughout Isaiah, even in Deutero-Isaiah, like chapters 40 through 66, primarily mm -hmm. in chapters 40 through 66, you get this idea that there is an idol of all the earth. And this idol of all the earth that is mentioned in Isaiah it at least makes me wonder what the shape of this thing is mm. because the idol of all the earth or the land in Isaiah, I don't have the verses written down. I didn't know that we would get this far. Talks about the figure of a man and you would fasten it to a tree that it would not move. It's just oh, yeah, strange. Right. It just, it makes me wonder, but this, whatever this is, I take it that Hezekiah says, bring that, bronze thing here and we're going to destroy it hmm. now i i don't want i want to throw this into the mix um right. as a, as we've already pointed out this clearly is in violation of the first commandment do not make an idol of anything you know uh, on the earth and and da -da -da, do not bow down to it and don't um uh venerate and anything like that in any way but then we have uh, we're supposed to understand, at least this narrative would, would be telling us, that God instructed Moses to do exactly that as a remedy for the uh, the grumbling of, of the people. Well, two wrongs don't make a right, Ross, do they? I don't think so. 
And, um, and this is just one of two primary examples of where we're to understand that God made uh, or instructed uh, people to indulge in a form of uh, idolatry or, or making an image of things either in heaven or or uh, upon the earth. The other one, of yeah. course, we've already mentioned being the um, uh, cherubim upon the ark, not the one that Moses made, not the box that Moses made, but the elaborate uh, one that we read about in Exodus, which uh, uh, many scholars would suggest, well, this is a priestly edition. Uh, yeah. this, this elaborate box is a priestly edition. And this is... Uh, uh, and when we come to these kind of stories, which is clearly set apart in its own little narrative within within the book, um, can we come to the same conclusion and say, "Well, this is clearly a story." In fact, I wonder, Ross, All if right. they, if they, if the priests uh, or the people somehow venerated this uh, this bronze statue, uh, a, a caduceus, if you like, very very common in the ancient world in the in the yep. uh, in, in the Middle East back in the day, very very common. Um, even before Moses, that they had one of these ancient things and and uh, that they were burning incense to it. And to give it some sort of credibility, they sprinkle a little bit of Moses sugar on top and say, well, here's the story of how this came to be, right? Yeah, yeah there were snakes in the wilderness and it was biting people. And, I, and God said to Moses, God told him to make this thing so that when they look at it, they would be healed. Is it possible that something like that happened, do you think? That is uh, that is very interesting because then it would explain. Now, I know a lot of people who would be more fundamental in their approach would say, no, it says in Numbers 21 that God said, make this thing. But we have confusing things there. Like we said, we've got some idea that, uh, that he's, he's supposed to make this, but he makes something else. There's some conflictions there. And then as you point out, why on earth, would the very thing in the beginning of the Decalogue says, don't make anything like this. Mm -hmm. How is it that they enter into the story? Well, I think you might be onto something. I mean, and, and, and what better way, one more point, what better way if you go to the priest and you're on this mission to clean house, you go, we're going to destroy all these idols. And they go, not this one, not this one. Why not that one? Uh, Moses made this one. What? Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, there's it's a story a, about this that. Is a Moses. Moses made it. I'm not going <laughs> to so tear this give up. Give it a story to whitewash it, right? Um, and and it makes it into the the uh, into the canon. Now, just to give this a little bit more strength, because really I find this theory compelling. Um, we began with uh, jumping over the first few verses of chapter uh, twenty one. Um, let me just read the study note on verse one, which is because we talked about Arad. And, you know, if we, like I said, if we have time, we're going to go to Arad when we're in Israel. We'll see how we go. Uh, but verse one, this is the study notes on uh, verse one. It says the king, a king of Arad, archaeological excavations show no evidence of a settlement at Arad in the second millennium. Probably the writer, uh, uh, living at a latter time when Israel's uh, Israelite Arad was inhabited, assumed that during the Exodus period, the Canaanite king resided there on Hormah. Okay, so um, there is great, and, and Hormah as well, there's, there's great archaeological objection to uh, to the dating of, of um, the claims of, of numbers uh, yeah. for very good reason. I'm just wondering if the narrative that follows uh, that which is so contested is also uh, would it be an interpolation? Is this the uh, something that is inserted at a later date to justify something that uh, that they already had? Maybe, yeah, you That's know, my... very very likely. Uh, I tell mm. you, it is a fascinating study. We do time. have, if if we had time to go to uh, to a rod, we don't know. We've just got so many new things we're going to see. But but nonetheless, we'll be in that neighborhood, and mm -hmm. there are there are by the way Bronze Age. There are Canaanite. Um, uh, there is a Canaanite tier at Arad, so we do. I don't I don't know that I misheard the the uh, the footnote there, but it, there, there is, is some habitation there. Yeah, yeah, and mm. and we're pretty sure about the location. We've got a couple of people, Jono. We've gone uh, for a little bit longer, and I, I knew it would. But uh, look, TanakhTours.com, I, I don't know. I saw that someone was asking, do we have any more space available on the tour? I guess we've got to get up with the Israelis and find out 
We Israel do. We were told the door yeah. is closing, but uh, the door has closed for Egypt and Jordan. You're not getting on that yeah. one. You're just like Ross said, weeping and gnashing of teeth until November next year. And we're already starting to plan that one, and those details will arrive soon, and you can place deposits as soon. We'll let you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, but Israel. I, I'm going to say yes at this point, but you've got to be real Anak quick. Tours, Tours com. Yeah, they got it. And this isn't just, com. yeah. Spent a lot of time Go in ahead. Isaiah today. You're in Isaiah every Shabbat morning. Bring us up to speed. Where are you at? All right. We, we've we actually, uh, you never get finished with anything, but we have, talking about closing the door, mm. we've pushed the door to on Isaiah and Seth and I are producing beginning this Saturday. I'll be live 10:30 a.m. on Ross K. Nichols TV, same place mm -hmm. right, here right here on YouTube, and and we're going to be talking about the House of David, the House of David, because we mm -hmm. we began to look at some messianic passages last uh, couple of weeks, as you do, and now we're going to shift to this idea of the Davidic house. And what are the promises? Uh, you know, some people would even argue, based on, you know, the past couple of thousand years, that that Davidic promise was not maintained. And we're going to mm. look at that. We're going to look at what did, according to the biblical text, what did God promise uh, this Davidic house? Yeah, so this is, this is going to be interesting. Everybody joins. It's yeah. a little bit related too, right? Because Hezekiah is uh, a contemporary of Isaiah, and it yeah. was Hezekiah who 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 asked God for extra years. Uh, and and Isaiah said, uh, you know, and there was the, the, the miracle of the the sundial. The the, the time went, uh, and it was a sign. He got fifteen years, and then he had Manasseh, a descendant yeah. of David, who just messed everything up in a major way. In what way is 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 these are these promises conditional or are they not? Um, we're going to find out. So you're going to address that this. Uh, we this we, we are. We're gonna we're gonna introduce the house of David. We're gonna start mm -hmm. there, uh, and then remember we're gonna be in Israel for several weeks. So we're gonna try. Uh, we've got a plan. Seth and I have worked on a very tight schedule to get us through. Uh, the next three weeks to get us to a point that when we go to Israel, when we go to Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, that we'll be able to devote our full time to the people that are there. Uh, there we is. also intend to do some things with, uh, particularly with our patrons who support everything that we're doing. Uh, by the way, we got some new equipment because of uh, people who join the patron, and oh, and so yeah. we're we're looking forward to doing some special things for that group. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining the patron. You can uh, scan that the code QR there code. and be a member. Yeah, yeah. so get the QR code there. Join the pa uh, the Patreon uh, and be part of the, the goodies that are offered there. That is it for this week, is it? Is that What are we going to talk about next week? Do we know yet? I, I, we've got some ideas, but I think what we'll do right. is after we get offline, let's, talk about this. Get, let's pull Seth in and, uh, yeah. and let's talk about the next one. Look. We are this this podcast series that mm. we're doing this season is called Beyond Belief, and I'm looking forward to Beyond Belief uh, next week because we've got some really good ideas. So that was you've been watching Ross and Jono. That was Nahushtan uh, and all things related. We'll be back this time next week. Till then, have a good one. Have a beautiful week. And we'll see you next week. Let me give them one more shot of this uh, beautiful. There, <laughs> and that is not photoshopped in any way, as Seth said. That's actually what you look, look like. Look at that. Is that cool? <laughs> that is cool. That's why I tell you you look like Papa Smurf. <laughs>